One of the most fascinating questions that I'm trying to find the answer to through my work in neuromarketing, neuro HR, and neuro leadership is the relationship between the brain and reality. How the brain perceives, decodes, gives meaning, and prepares for action in relation to reality. And I think that we go through our lives with this mistaken, outdated, and I would say wrong impression that what we see consciously with our mind's eye is what happens out there. But that's not how the brain works. Let's do a, a very fast test together, a, an exercise. So can you please put in front of you your thumbs like that? And while you're looking at me, Try to see if there is any black hole where your thumbs are. There should be two black holes where your thumbs are. But you don't see black holes. You see your thumbs. However, on your eyeball, where exactly your optical nerve connects to your eyeball, there is no information coming from the outside world through your optical nerve inside your brain. Because the optical nerve connects to the eye, there is no receptors there, there is no actually image decoded from the outside world. However, when you do this, you don't see black holes, you see your thumbs. Who creates this image for you where there should be black holes? And the answer is your brain. Because your brain does not just project, rea project reality into, into you, it creates it. One more small test to maybe see even better how your brain creates reality. So again, looking at me, try to see if you can detect any colors around the main focal point, the point of concentration inside, you know, in front of the, of the screen. You will see that actually while looking at me, you can still perceive a colored background around me. Well, that's not true because uh, in, in uh, uh, around of the peripheral of the peripheral vision, not exactly what you are focusing, but around, there is no c color photoreceptors. You see, actually, you receive black and white image and a blurry one, not very high definition, and a very blurry and black and white image. However, your experience of reality is full colors. So you see that the brain takes liberties and sometimes quite creative liberties in order to fill in data that you're not receiving for reality, just to to give you a sense of a more fluid, continuous, and integrative image. Now. You might think that, okay, that's interesting, that's funny, but it's not so profound, but it becomes very profound, so profound that it even your life can depend on it. So as you can see, the brain receives information, processes it, colors it, actually creates color, and then recreates this reality in your mind in order to have meaning and to make sense. Listen to this now, how far this goes. Let's say I'm a caveman and I come out of my cave and there is some movement of branches on the side on my right. Now this movement of the branches, the bush, has zero information. Is it dangerous? Is it a friend? Is it just the wind? Unless I have the complete picture with all the information in order to have a conclusive decision what is there, I cannot say if there is danger, if there is nothing, or if there is something positive. How dangerous this could be for our survival as a species. If as a caveman I come out of my cave and there is this movement and my brain waits until it collects all the right data, the complete picture, and have a conclusive insight of what is happening, I'm already dead. Because in the case that there is a bear there, or a wolf, or a competing tribe that came to take our resources, I'm already dead if I wait for reality to give me all the objective information, and then for my brain to take the decision to prepare me for something. So the genes, the DNA of our ancestors, that waited for all the data to be ready until they prepared for reaction, they are dead. We don't have their DNA. The DNA we have is from the people that their brains, the cave people that their brains, did not wait for all possible objective information to be present for the brain to react. No, we have the brains of people that 
the brain received the, the, the data, the stimuli that something might be moving there. This information went to a specific part of their brains, which is called the thalamus, much before I become conscious of it. The thalamus evaluated the information to detect potential threat. It, it labeled it as potential threat. It initiated a cascading number of changes in my body. It starts making my heart beat faster. I start sweating. My visual field is changing. Even the motor part of my brain is preparing to act, which means to run much before I have a conclusive and full picture if there is something there. Because this type of pattern identification, this pattern of if you want mistake, maybe there is something there, actually helped me survive. This kind of mistake, it's called a false positive. What is a false positive? I think something is there. My brain analyzes all the data and labels it. It gives it color. It gives it meaning. It, it takes real information, actionable information that might, something might be wrong and already prepares my body, takes the decision and prepares my full body for me to run. Now, it might be that nine out of 10 times, it's a false positive. I thought something was there. I thought something was attacking me and there was nothing. Nine times this is fine, but the tenth time that actually a tiger was there or a competing tribe person was there, it saved me. And my genes, the genes of these people, the DNA is what I carry now. Now imagine the, if it was the opposite. If I was going for a false negative means that I think that nothing is there and it ends up something being there. So if I just, my brain just perceives the info from the moving branches or the bush and the, and, the, and the sound and the noise. And then my brain says, well, nothing is there. At least, at least until I see something which can convince me that something is there. So maybe nine out of 10, nothing was there. But the 10th time that actually a wolf was there, I'm dead. My brain did not prepare my body to run, to fight, to shout, to escape, and I'm dead. So you see that Information for the brain is important when it is labeled, when it is colored, when there is value, let's call it like that, when there is value in it in order to prepare me either for a negative outcome or a positive outcome. And my brain loves, prefers, has learned through evolution that finding patterns is very important than ignoring patterns or ignoring information. So for the brain, information is all out there and it's important when it says something to the brain. Something is happening, let's prepare. Now that's very interesting and very important and it has profound effect in our role as leaders, marketeers, managers, business people, of course politicians, but also as simple citizens. Why? How does the brain, what kind of specific label does it assign to information? Positive, negative, neutral, immediate action, later action, thing to remember later, later, or something that makes me connect with this person or avoid this person. How does the brain decide what type of label to put? Now that's very important. Because there are some labels, as I explained before, as a cave person coming out of my cave, there are some signals and messages that the brain learned that might be uh, disastrous or beneficial based on our collective evolution after millions of years of, of evolving a species, that's fine, but also there is learning based on individual experience. And my individual experience as a human being will teach my brain what label to put to information coming in, in order to initiate action, prepare me for, for, for what is going to happen, predict what will happen later, and guide my behavior. I'll give you an example of this. Let's say me and my friend John are walking down uh, the main street here in, in Ljubljana, in front of Salon Hotel that we are now. <laughs> and um, there is a, a car which is exhaust backfires. You know, there's a, there's a big, loud, scary sound. Now, my friend John is in the military and he toured, I mean, he went for service to war zones, you know, Afghanistan, Iraq, Africa, and he's back now. Now, me and him walk down the street and there is the same sound, the same stimulus 
the same sound waves received by both our brains. However, me being a city person and never experiencing these difficult situations, I might turn, my brain might say, and hey, there might be a problem there, but I will continue walking as normal. However, John, having experienced war, his brain, the moment it receives this kind of information and taking this, this auditory information in the thalamus. The thalamus knows, has learned that this is a life-threatening sound. Maybe there is a bomb, maybe there is an attack. Okay, so we need to, to save ourselves. So in a split of a second, while I continue walking, John is already jumping to hide behind uh, another car or to enter a building. Of course, later John will stand up and say, oh, what happened? Yes, it was a car. But the experience of being in a war, the trauma, the efforts, the hazards, the threats, the traps, the deaths maybe of his, of his friends taught deeply the brain of John that when this happens, probably this is what it means, that's the best reaction to it. So all that information between two people is the same that the, the, our brain, the same the same stimulus comes from the external environment. How the brain will receive it, and as I said, in a split of a second, actually multiple times per second, will analyze it, will color it, give it, give it a label, and assign value to it, and then, of course, trigger behavior out of it, is very different based on our learnings and experience in life. Now, let's say you're in a company, you're a manager, Maybe you are even a leader. The way that you communicate, that you announce information, and you give and you share information to your people, it might look like simple pieces of information that because they're in the same company, maybe they have the same education, maybe they come from the same country, their brain will decode it in the same way that your brain does. But that's a very big, and I will call it lazy mistake of management. Each person's brain, based on their experiences, and a lot, a lot has to do with genetics as well, but that's for another speech. So based on their experience, the same word, the same picture, the same Excel file, the same pie chart might indicate, trigger, label, a label or value which is different between people. The same with marketing, sales, promotions, and communications outside of the company. You might say one thing, but how the brains of each person, the brain of each person decodes and assigns value and meaning and prepares for action might be very different. So this means that we have to be extra careful in order to shape our relationships and our communications in ways that takes into account this personal, personalized, individual way that the brains of our people in the company or our customers decode, assign value, and prepare for action. One size fits all. It's not only wrong, it's dangerous, and it's even unethical. And this is why leaders, salespeople as well, need to focus so much in understanding, and this requires interaction, this requires a relation, to everyone from our team, to understand how their individual brain motivates or blocks or decodes information and create action. Now, because we live in very strange times with a lot of uncertainty, where everything seems unpredictable, we went through a corona um, pandemic with lockdowns, we are going now through uh, uncertainty because of a uh, war in Europe. Um, the global supply chain seems broken with no clear view of where it's going to improve. So many people in businesses, but also in everyday life, feel insecure with fear and anxiety of what is going to happen next. Now, in these situations, the brain spends even more energy and it's more focused in searching and identifying information that will help it make better sense of what is happening and predict much better the future in order to prepare, to, 
to manage its internal resources to make sure it's ready for what is, hap for what is happening and what is coming. So within this unpredictable and insecure mindset of people, information is even more important. Because the brain being anxious, I'm saying the brain, but I should say the brain and body. OK, the brain is not alone, swimming in the universe of nothingness. There is the brain and the body and the environment. That's the three important elements of the system, brain, body, environment. So our, our brain and body will absorb like a sponge information trying to cut through the noise to find, to find data, to find processes, to find companies, to find people that will help it solve the uncertainty. This is where this information, unfortunately, creates a lot of problems. Because, because of our anxiety, because of our brain's increased efforts to identify what labels should put in what information since the things that we go through are unprecedented. In this effort, sometimes, many times, unfortunately, we'll choose the, the wrong source of information, we'll assign the wrong label to specific information, and we'll, all this will result to wrong actions. You've heard about the popularity of conspiracy theories in this period. Why? Because if the brain identifies a source, a source of information that makes it manage the anxiety, decrease the stress, recreate hope, and especially, most importantly, feel that it can predict the future, that it can decode what is happening. Yes, I know why this is happening. And then, based on this, prepare for the future. This information will become very, very important. Our role as parents, our role as parents, as leaders, as citizens, as marketeers, as friends, is to make sure we understand all this. We understand that the brain doesn't just receive reality and project it, but recreates it inside our head. Understand the importance of information and labeling personally through our experiences at helping our own brain and the brains around us deal with this in a more positive, constructive and hopeful way. Thank you so much for having me.